Well, good morning, everyone. I think it's still morning, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, all right. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, as was announced, uh, this is Black History Month, and earlier I asked the question, um, can you tell me something about Black History Month? For example, uh, who was the one who actually put it together? And uh, it grew, of course, out of a, a week in which um, uh, Dr. Carter G. Wilson decided that we need to celebrate, we need to acknowledge, we need to understand the contributions that African Americans have made to uh, these United States. And so um, eventually that grew into a, a, a problem in which there were so many things happening among African Americans that a week did not seem to be enough. And so they expanded it to um, um, Black History Month. And with that, um, um, we have an opportunity to expand it even more so and think about black history the year round. So, um, a lot of people understand black history as uh, something in and of itself, something that's separate from everything else. But a lot of people um, take the position that I do that uh, black history is indeed American history. Okay. So today, um, what I'd like to do is to uh, talk a little bit about um, um, Representative Lewis. And, um, I put together a presentation that is designed to be not terribly long, maybe 20, 25 minutes, because what I'd like to do is to see if I can engage you in questions and comments, okay? So um, <clears throat> um, I've, I've titled this piece, Good Trouble, or Disturbing the Peace, The Importance of Humanities in Distressing Times. Let me see if I can get this to work. Did I turn it off? Oh, here it is. There we go. It was March the 7th, 1965. It was a Sunday, a day historians etched in our memories as Bloody Sunday. I wonder what ideas coursed through the mind of civil rights activist John Lewis as he lay barely conscious from the savage, the, the merciless beating inflicted by a billy club wielding white highway patrolman. This representative of law and order obviously did not share uh, Lewis's political goals. He undoubtedly felt that he was being obedient in following commands to maintain the status quo. But this Sunday, this bloody Sunday, at the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama, Lewis and the other 600 protesters were on a mission. Guided by the principles of nonviolent direct action, these courageous activists were determined to sacrifice their black bodies to claim their right to vote. Even if it meant dying for a cause, they were set on creating what Lewis later called good trouble, necessary trouble. Good trouble, he said, was about dramatizing something that needs changing and correcting. His arrest and sacrifices of his body, he felt, helped to raise awareness for the wrongs, not just in Alabama, but throughout the world. The struggle waged that day signified more than a, than a quest to, for the right to vote. It was also a demand for the rights of full citizenship in a time and place that would keep them mired in the social order as second-class citizens. Stated another way, they were marching to claim their very humanity. On that bloody day, Lewis and others found themselves reenacting a drama as old as 1619, when Africans first landed at Jamestown, Virginia. The question of citizenship and humanity are inextricably intertwined, with the former asking, who is an American? And the latter asking, what does it mean to be human? Well, today, we generally look to such branches of knowledge as philosophy and 
literature and music and art and among many others for meaningful definition of humanities. After all, these areas of learning engage study of, the, uh, of human nature and human experience. Did it change? Did it change? Uh, okay. Okay. All right. But if we uh, <clears throat> delve more deeply, we come to understand the position argued by educator Lynn Maxwell White that the humanities offer models and methods uh, for addressing dilemmas and acknowledging ambiguity and paradox. They can help us face the tension between the concerns of individuals and those of groups and promote civil and informed discussion of conflicts, placing current issues in historical perspectives. We can test the, the validity of, of White's argument by looking briefly at two discrete examples to determine the function of humanities in times of political or social crisis, contentiousness, and disagreement. Let's look at Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation and Booker T. Washington's Atlanta Exposition Speech. Uh, <clears throat> as a kind of a public service announcement, if you get a chance, go to the History Channel. And Doris Kearns Goodwin, who is one of the nation's foremost historians, uh, has produced um, a documentary on Abraham Lincoln. I think you would find it really interesting. Okay. Uh, number five. Right. If I were to conduct a survey about Lincoln and the Emancipation Proclamation, I'm almost positive that most of you would respond in ways that glorified or idealized him and his document. Such responses would not be unusual. Uh, Lincoln has emerged from historical accounts as who? The great emancipator. His reputation for supposedly freeing the slaves has grown to mythic proportions, and his image as an abolitionist has grown accordingly. Poets like Walt Whitman and Langston Hughes have penned praise songs to him. The resulting myth is that Lincoln, a true hero, was indeed larger than life, and his Emancipation Proclamation profoundly contributed to healing a nation torn asunder by civil war and to erasing the boundaries separating master and slave. Well, <clears throat> in reality, Lincoln was a man <clears throat> beset with paradox and internal conflicts. His inner turmoil resulted from the complicated political positions he had to negotiate and reconcile. Consequently, the Lincoln of Steven Spielberg's uh, movie, uh, it's sticking together. Steven Spielberg's 2012 film uh, indicates we have a dark, brooding, tormented, yet manipulative president. He might be closer to the actual president than the image in our popular imagination. Um, what caused Lincoln to be so troubled? Well, <clears throat> for one, he embraced a number of fallacious beliefs he inherited about African Americans. Misguided assumptions about the race tried to make the case that blacks were not human beings, but instead were chattel or property bereft of reasoning uh, or ability to create. Some of them were expressed by philosophers before they became foundational bases in law. Scottish philosopher uh, David Hume, for example, made this argument. I am apt to suspect the Negroes to be naturally inferior to whites. He was followed by German philosopher Immanuel Kant, who asserted that not a single Negro was ever found who presented anything great in art or science. Even Thomas Jefferson <laughs> weighed in by disparaging one of the first African-American poets by claiming she had no imagination 
and that her work was below the dignity of criticism. The three-fifths compromise in the original Constitution was predicated on these misperceptions. This law was further advanced by the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act, as well as the 1857 Dred Scott decision rendered by the U.S. Supreme Court. Now, in their case, the court decided that the Negro had no rights that the white man needed to respect. Then shortly before Lincoln was inaugurated, Congress and several states ratified the first version of the 13th Amendment to the Constitution. Now in this version, the first one, Congress was prohibited from passing laws to abolish slavery. It was complemented by a series of laws forbidding blacks from uh, having the right to vote or hold public office. States were also empowered to colonize free blacks and mulattoes wherever they wished to remove them to. Well, amid these debates and shifting policies, Lincoln was forced to stake out his own position. I think it is fair to say that on the issue of slavery, Lincoln could be considered a centrist. Clearly, he was not the abolitionist and the friend of the Negro many thought he was. We now know he favored colonization as the solution to slavery. But deporting slaves presented another problem for Lincoln. After the Civil War broke out, it appeared the secessionists were set to use slaves for support on the plantations, thus freeing up more white men to fight in the war. Well, Lincoln had to decide how to subvert this Southern strategy. The issue got reduced to this particular dilemma. Should he simply liberate the slaves or should he compensate the owners for their loss of property, quote unquote. The Emancipation Proclamation represented a compromise between these two competing positions. On January the 1st, 1863, he officially issued an executive order proclaiming that slaves in those states of those areas of rebellion would be henceforth uh, and forever free. In the other areas which had not seceded from the Union, the institution of slavery would remain intact. Like Lincoln, Booker T. Washington, from most historical accounts, I'd say, emerged as a leader fraught with paradox and contradiction. For example, the most influential black man in the latter half of the 19th century was Frederick Douglass, the renowned abolitionist and champion of women's rights. Washington is often portrayed as a ghoulish figure waiting for Douglass to die so that he could claim Douglass's mantle as the leader of African Americans. Well, on February the 20th, 1895, Douglass died. Seven months later, Washington gave the most consequential speech of his life. Often called the Atlanta Compromise speech, it cemented his position as the leader of African Americans. Washington was like a man on a tightrope. Southern whites were waiting for him to slip and misspeak about interracial affairs. People of color prayed he would retain his balance and lead them through the malaise of post-Reconstruction politics. Washington had to navigate a way through the treacherous politics that saw the protection once afforded blacks by the North slowly erode and the so-called Negro problem was thrust back into the hands of the South who supposedly knew the Negro best. The citizenship, citizenship amendments to the Constitution, I'm talking about the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments that afforded African Americans the opportunity to participate in the body politic, these were slowly undone by a series of laws as well as by such organizations as the Ku Klux Klan, the Knights of the White Camellias, and other secret societies. 
In the heart of Alabama, where he founded his Tuskegee Institute, Washington had to project the appearance of being non-threatening while subtly undermining the status quo. Nowhere was this duplicity more apparent than in the speech he gave at the Cotton States Exposition in Atlanta in September 1895. Was Washington a genius or a traitor to the race? His critics felt he made too many concessions to the white powers, powers to be when he proclaimed that blacks did not need the right to vote, that the practicality of an industrial education was far more important for blacks than a liberal arts course of study, and the quest for social equality should be forsaken for the acceptance of racial separation. On the other hand, he was shrewd enough to argue how valuable blacks were to the South, the white South, and that the fate of whites was linked to black people. Whites, for example, should adopt anti-immigration, I'm talking about immigration with an I, and anti-labor policies, and give, reference, and give preference to blacks with whom they've had relations for lo these many years. At the same time, he encouraged blacks to forego thoughts of immigration, I'm talking about with an E, the exit, because their best opportunity to thrive lay, if I could turn the page, Excuse me, they're sticking together. Because um, their best opportunity lay in the South among the whites with whom they had a long association. In one line that endeared him to whites and ultimately angered many blacks, he said, um, next one, in all things that are purely social, we can be as separate as the fingers yet one as the hand in all things mutual, essential to mutual progress. Now whether this was political astuteness or a capitulation to an inferior place in the social order, that is the subject of continuous debate. One thing is true. Washington anticipated the ruling by the U.S. Supreme Court in 1896, a year later, that legalized racial segregation. The decision rendered in Plessy versus Ferguson gave the, the, gave the nation the concept of separate but equal, which was the law of the land until Brown v. Board in 1954. Well, it can be said of Washington that like Brad Rabbit in uh, Black Folklore, he was shrewd, he was duplicitous, he was manipulative. Given the socio-political environment of his time, his quest to reclaim the humanity of black people required an ability to debunk racial stereotypes while at the same time avoid offending the whites who were in power. Both Lincoln and Washington created what John Lewis called good trouble. Lincoln perhaps was less altruistic than Washington, but he was certainly, uh, st he certainly stimulated conversations about the humanity and citizenship rights of African descended people. Now whether Washington's politics were motivated by self-interest or racial advance, he, initi he initiated a discussion that continues to this day. What can we take away from both figures can be succinctly summed up in the astute observation of Eddie Glaude Jr., the one that he made in his marvelous book, Begin Again. Begin Again means the examination of fundamental values and commitments that shape our self-understanding and that we look back to those beginnings not to reaffirm our greatness or to double down on myths that secure our innocence, but to see where we went wrong and how we might reimagine 
or recreate ourselves in light of who we actually initially set out to be. If you've been able to watch the news lately, you've seen how current events have become skewed and confusing. Facts have been distorted into, my favorite phrase, alternative facts. Sadly, many politicians and even some educators have begun seeking to ignore, revise, or erase history. Instead of running from history, we should be clamoring to learn more about our past. The way forward is not leaving the past behind, but by examining it carefully and honestly for what it can teach us. We need to embrace it as part of what makes us who we are. Such then is the benefit of good trouble. Now with this understanding, we can figure out what is wrong and how to correct it. We can figure out how we got here, and I'm hopeful where we go from here. As I leave today, I leave you with two questions to ponder. I want you to think about, and maybe even debate, where do we go from here? And what does our good trouble look like? Okay? Thank you for your attention. Thank you.